Just to secure out, and I'm good with that. Jonathan, do you want to um, do a health session with you? We can do a health session tomorrow. Yeah. 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 Back in the morning. Okay. I'm sorry. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. You can take your time. Yeah. You can make it up. Yeah. Yeah. You can go to your. Okay. guys welcome to class good seeing you guys in the classroom and also those who are uh, on teams uh, let me start off by talking about the calendar and see if you guys have any questions there so this is on my website um, I updated this uh, this weekend so first thing is uh, today we're going to be going over chain rules so we're talking a new uh, section today uh, tomorrow we'll do implicit differentiation uh, and then that's going to end our um, chapter two, um, uh, the last new material for chapter two. Uh, there's related rates as well, but we're going to treat related rates as a completely different unit. But after um, Tuesday, uh, we'll, we can begin reviewing. So Wednesday, eight, uh, asynchronous day. So I want to do a help session in the morning, 830 to 930. Good morning. If you have fourth period A lunch, teachers, this would be the time to dismiss those students to go to lunch. That is fourth period A lunch. Okay. Um, now I'm um, in the process of grading your uh, your quiz, your uh, derivative quiz. So if I can get that done by Wednesday, then I'll have a help session 9.30 to 10.30 uh, going over the quiz. And that's, um, but yeah, I'll let you guys know. But I definitely want to do a help session over today and tomorrow's material uh, on Wednesday. But again, that's optional, and I'll also record it if you want to check it out later. And then Thursday and Friday, we'll do test review. So test review, um, there's still some types of problems that we haven't quite seen. I'm waiting until test review to, to go over them. Um, so we'll do um, two days of review. But I didn't want to stick the test uh, on the Monday. So um, next week, I wanted to start the next section, 2.6. Not going to be on the test, but, uh, but I didn't want to lose any instruction days. So um, Monday and Tuesday, we'll do related rates. Uh, but then that kind of gives you more time to study for a chapter two test. 
and that also gives me Wednesday to allow for me to have another help session over to uh, over chapter two. And then we'll have a test next Thursday, 2.2, 2.5. And then I'll, I'll have a morning help session at 7.15. Okay, any questions with the calendar schedule for the next week, this week and next? Uh, there's also, uh, you see the classwork 2.1 and 2.3 assignment is due on Wednesday. So um, your classwork notes, just like how we did with limits, uh, that's due on Wednesday, but it's only uh, formative grade and you can turn in late and you'll still get, um, I won't take off any you know, points for that. Um, if you haven't turned in your limits um, or chapter one um, classwork homework, notes you can still turn those in so through through teams all right no questions all right let's go into our notes Okay, hopefully you guys have your notes printed out, uh, but if you don't, you just follow along. It's not a whole lot to write down. Make sure I'm recording here. Okay. Okay, so so far, uh, the derivative rules that we've learned is power rule, product rule, and quotient rule. So product rule is where we have two separate expressions multiplied together, and we're trying to find a slope formula for that. Uh, quotient rule is you have a numerator and denominator, and you're trying to find the derivative of that. Chain rule is for composition of function. If we have a function within a function, we apply chain rule. Um, so sometimes students get this mixed up with product rule because it kind of looks similar. Um, but this is not f of x times g of x. This is f, this is f of g of x, so the g is inside the f function. So we have a slightly different method of doing that versus product rule. Okay. Okay, so uh, here's what the rule says. I want to find the derivative of f of g of x. So f prime of g of x, this is saying that I want to find the derivative of the outside portion while keeping the inside portion unchanged. So we're going to take turns. We're taking their derivatives. So we're going to take the outside function's derivative or outside portion's derivative. Multiply by the inside portion's derivative. That's the g prime. So again, we take the derivative of the outside while keeping the inside portion unchanged. And then we multiply it by the derivative of the inside portion. OK, so right now it just feels like a bunch of words. I want to kind of talk about the example. So kind of make so that I can begin to make more sense. So if we look at this problem here, 3x squared plus 2 to the fifth power. If if all we had was power rule. What will we need to do if we want to apply power rule to this problem? Or what needs to be resolved first?
the parentheses? Yeah, the parentheses can't be there, right? We, we know that was one of the conditions for, for power rule. But if you can, you know, having to expand this is kind of a mess, right? So in this in this course, I'm only going to expect you to expand to a second power, right? That's doable. But anything higher than second power, we want to find a more efficient way of working through. So we could do this, but this is not very efficient if we want to rely on power rule. But here's the thing, though, is that what if we think of this as a function within a function? What if we think of this as there's an outside portion and inside portion? Then we can allow this to be a, com a composition and then we can apply chain rule. So this is what we're going to do. So we're going to identify the outside portion. Identify the inside portion. So what's the outside portion of this problem? It's going to be the parentheses and everything outside the parentheses. So the outside portion is the parentheses to the fifth power. The inside portion is whatever you see inside the parentheses, so that's going to be 3x squared plus 2. OK, so we're going to take turns with each of these derivatives. Now, the way you find the derivative for parentheses to the fifth power, you're going to treat parentheses like its own variable. So imagine this is x to the fifth power. But instead of x, you're going to see parentheses. So what do you think is the derivative of parentheses to the fifth power? So imagine going through power rule. How would that look? Or let me ask you this. If I asked you for x to the fifth power, what would you what would you say the derivative is? 5x to the fourth. Okay. So if I gave you parentheses to the fifth power, what do you think that derivative would be? Parentheses to the fourth. Five parentheses to the fourth, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. So just Kind of do a little bit of an adjustment in your head. Just treat the parentheses as a variable and then just do power rule. So the outsized derivative is going to be five parentheses to the fourth. So that takes care of my outside portions derivative. We'll fill this in later. Multiplied by the inside portions derivative. So what's the inside portions derivative? 6x. 6x. Right. The 2 goes away. We're just left with 6x. Now, the question is what goes inside the first set of parentheses? And that's just going to be the original g of x. So you're just going to drag down whatever you see in the original problem, no changes. So whenever you have a function within a function, identify the two portions, find the derivative of the outside first, and then in a separate location, find the derivative of the inside portion, and then fill in the first set of parentheses with the original expression. That's the derivative. That's the slope formula for whatever this graph looks like. Okay. Any questions? I'm going to do a little bit of cleanup, F prime. And by cleanup, I just mean that I see the 5 and the 6x. Those can be moved and rearranged. So I'll just push that all out to the front. And I get 30x in front.
Where did you get the 6x from? Okay, the 6x came from the derivative of the inside portion here. Thank you. So let me uh, let me write this out again here. So f prime is five. So this portion is the outside. This is the f prime of g of x. And the six x is the g prime. All right, any questions with example one? Because we're just going to, this is an easier example. So um, I want to know if you have any questions because we're just going to build on top of this uh, more and more involved. I do want to point out common mistake that I see students make is they, I think students sometimes they want to streamline the process. They want to kind of push these derivatives a little closer to each other. So, um, I think a lot of students realize that there's an inside and outside portion, and so they would find the outside derivative. But then they would stick the inside derivative inside the parentheses and kind of streamline the process. So this doesn't work. Right, so we can't quite do that. Even though it feels like a more efficient way of doing it, right? Why not just stick the G prime directly in and and we just get rid of that g of x, but that's not what the rules says. And also, if you were to expand all this out and go through the power rule and clean it up, it would turn into this. Right? And this doesn't uh, this doesn't quite work. OK, example two, any questions with example one? All right, example two, find all the values of x of the function for which f prime is equal to zero and where f prime does not exist. There's a couple of things going on here, but let's just worry about finding f prime. But before finding f prime, I want to rewrite this in a, a form that's maybe easier to work with. So how can I rewrite this without radicals? You can put all of that to the one third power. Uh, close to the what? Oh, two thirds. Two thirds, yeah. So the two is the uh, numerator exponent. And the three is the denominator exponent. Okay. You see some resemblance here with example one. There are portions with addition and subtraction inside with the exponent outside. And this we can't resolve. So we have to rely on chain rule. We have to think of it as an outside versus inside portion. So we got to go through chain rule. All right, so what's the outside portion of this problem? Mm -hmm. And the inside portion is the x squared minus one. All right, so chain rule, we got to take turns with their derivatives outside followed by inside. So let's find f prime, let's find the full derivative. So what's the outsized derivative here? Right. Just power rule, right? Can someone say what the derivative is for power rule here? 
2x? The 2x is for the inside, right? But what about the outside portion? What's the derivative of parentheses to the 2 thirds? 2 thirds parentheses to the negative 1 third. Right. Good. So pretend like the parentheses is just its own variable, right? It's its own like variable that uh, uh, we're just going to pretend like that's an x. Yeah. So 2 thirds parentheses to the negative 1 third. Right, you bring the exponent down, subtract one from the exponent, so minus three over three is negative one third. Times, what's the inside portion's derivative? Two x. Two x. And the negative one goes away, right? So just the two x. And then the initial set of parentheses, we just drag that down, right? No changes. Okay, I'm trying to go slow, but let me know. Are there any questions? Do we any questions about where these are coming from and the order that we're doing these in? No. OK, so we found the derivative. Let's just do a little bit of cleanup and then we can look to see what it's asking for us to find. Now cleanup. I just want this to be under one fraction. So the numerators I'll put together, denominators I'll try to put together. So the numerator I have two and two X, I can put that up as four X. Denominator I have the three. And then I can also push the parentheses down to the bottom, right? Okay, I'll put a box around this because this is what we're going to be using to help us find the next things that we need. Good so far? Okay. So let's move on to what this is asking for. It's asking for find where f prime is equal to zero and find where f prime does not exist. Okay, let me talk about what that means. So f prime equal to zero means where slope of the graph is zero. And the way that we do this in, in terms of what this problem is, is um, presenting us is we're going to be setting the numerator of f prime equal to zero. So when you do that and you solve for x, this is what you're achieving. You're finding the locations on the graph where the slope of the tangent line is zero. So this is you're finding these locations. I'm, I'm drawing that dotted line to indicate that these are places where slope is zero. Where the graph kind of flattens out for a moment. The other thing we're looking for is where F prime does not exist. So F prime doesn't exist means where my slope is undefined. And the way we do that is we set the denominator. of f prime equal to zero. And visually, f prime doesn't exist means your slope is undefined. And what does that look like? It could look like this. 
where there's a sharp turn. Or it may look like this where there's a vertical tangent line. Those are places where slope is undefined. Just want to kind of map this abstract steps that we're taking with some visual pictures. OK, so we have our derivative. If we set the numerator equal to zero, we'll be able to find locations where these behaviors occur, where there's a slope of zero. And then if we set the denominator of f prime equal to zero, we're able to find locations where this behavior occurs, either slope undefined or slope. Well, vertical tangents or um, sharp turns. You're not going to be asked to graph it, but it's nice to picture what it could look like. All right, so let's look at the numerator here. We'll set the numerator equal to zero. We solve for x. So this tells us that at x equals zero, our f prime is equal to zero. And that answers the first part that the question is asking, right? Okay. We're also going to set the denominator equal to zero, but if we set the denominator equal to zero, we're getting a completely different set of information, right? We're getting a we're getting locations where the slope is undefined. So now I'm just going through a bunch of algebraic steps to solve for x. So I'm going to divide by three. I'm going to cube both sides. And once I'm inside the parentheses, then I'll solve for x. Okay, I'll raise both sides, third power. Solve for x. Take the square root of both sides. Remember, if you take square root of both sides of the equation, a plus or minus shows up, right? So that means that x equals 1 and negative 1, our slope is undefined. OK, any questions here? Again, I'm not asking you to sketch the graph, but I just want to connect this with something visual, right? Because what we found was we know that at zero, there's going to be a slope zero. At one and negative one, we're expecting either sharp turns or slope undefined or uh, vertical tangents. So this is what the actual graph looks like. The actual graph looks something like this. Okay, you see how we're able to gather that information about x equals zero, there's a slope of zero, which we see here. And then at one and negative one, it came from the denominator, and that is where my slope is undefined. I have some sharp turns there. Okay, questions? Okay, back page. Does anybody still need this page here? You good? All 
All right, sample three. Find the equation of the tangent line. But to find tangent line, we need to find the derivative, and from the derivative, we can find the slope. So let's focus our attention on just trying to find the derivative. Okay, so this is what I want to do here. Anytime I have a numerator and denominator where it's just a constant, either just you know, in a numerator or all constant in a denominator, I can push those to the top and I can rely on, uh, I can avoid quotient rule basically. Anytime a numerator and denominator is just a number, I'm always looking to avoid quotient rule. So I'm going to bring the x plus 2 up. The only thing I have to adjust is changing that exponent. Because any constant or any coefficient, it's just it's easy to deal with. There's not a lot of messiness involved. And anytime we can avoid quotient rule, it just could make things easier. So there's my rewritten expression. This I can't expand, right? Order of operations, the negative two, I can't distribute that through. So I'm stuck with the form that it's already in. But I think this is a good one to apply chain rule for. Because we see parentheses with multiple terms inside and exponent outside. So here's the outside portion. And then here's the inside portion. And then we'll take turns with each of their derivatives and that will give us the full derivative for our function. All right, so let's find y prime. All right, outside's derivative. What's outside's derivative going to be? Good. Negative eight parentheses to the negative three. That takes care of my outside portion times the inside portion. What's the inside portion's derivative? Just one, right? X goes to one, two goes to zero. But don't forget your original set of parentheses is going to be whatever you see in the original problem, the X plus two. Okay, question so far. All right, we have the derivative, but I'm just going to clean this up. Makes it a little bit easier to work with when we want to find the slope. So I'm going to bring that x plus 2 down. Keep the negative 8 up top. All right, so there's my derivative, which will help me find the slope. And the original function is going to help me find the order pair. From there, we can build our tangent line equation. Did you not choose the negative eight to the positive eight and put it in the negative Let's see. Um, you mean from here to here? Oh, oh, I didn't see the sign into the negative three. Oh, right. Yeah, that negative three is going to come down. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, it's good. Any questions? Any other questions? All right, so now we're going to take this x value and we're going to plug into both expressions. Into the original will give us the y value, into the derivative will give us the slope. So let's find the point first. So plug negative 3 in for the original function. So 4 over negative 1 squared, that's 4 over 1, which is 4. OK, 
Okay, next we want to find the slope. So we'll plug negative three into the derivative. So I have negative eight over negative one cubed. So negative over negative is positive. So my graph is gonna be rather steep at this point. Slope of eight, order pair negative three, four. So now we can build our tangent line equation. So here's my summary here. My order pair is negative three, four. My slope is eight, and now here's my point slope. Um, Mr. Yang, I have a quick question. Yes, question. Okay, so for um, the point y negative three, where did you get the four from in the numerator again? So that four came from the original problem. Oh, 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 sorry, sorry. Okay. Right, yeah. So our point is always going to come from the original y, and the slope is always going to come from the derivative y. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? All right, so let's look at example four. We're going to get more um, kind of into messier and messier types of problems here. OK, if you look at example four here, this is not something that we can easily expand, right? We prefer to not expand this out, and if we expand it out, it's not going to make things any Cleaner. I guess we could expand it out and go through quotient rule, but we want a more efficient way of working through this. So we see parentheses with terms inside, with exponent outside. We're going to rely on chain rule. All right. So what's we need to identify the outside and inside portion. All right, so what's the outside portion of my problem here? Mm -hmm. And the inside portion we can see right there in front of us. Okay, a little more involved, but we're going to follow the same steps that we did before. We'll take the derivative of the outside portion, which is just power rule, right? And then next up, we'll take the derivative of the inside portion, which will require what? What's involved to find the derivative of something that looks like this? Quotient rule. Yeah, we got to do quotient rule. Okay, so this portion requires quotient rule. OK, so we'll take it step, one step at a time following the same procedure that we've done before. It's just that now within each part, we've got a little more involvement than before. So we're ready for the derivative. Y prime equals. All right, first up. What's outsized derivative? Yeah, just power rule, right? OK, three parentheses squared. Times. 
Now I have a separate section for my inside portions derivative. I'll leave some room because we know we got to go through quotient rule. And I'm going to label the parts that we're going to fill in. So there's the F portion, there's the G portion. We'll do F prime G minus F G prime. All over G squared. All right, so F prime. What's F prime? What can we put in here? One. It's one, right? X minus one's derivative is just one, so that goes here. G function, no changes. I'm just going to copy that down. F, no changes. Copy this down. But what's G prime? What goes in this space? 2x. There's 2x, right? x squared becomes 2x, negative 4 goes to 0. All over my denominator squared. So. The original parentheses, we're just going to drag this down, right? No changes. OK. We've done the majority. I mean, we have the answer, right? We found the derivative. The rest is just clean up. So we've gotten through the most important part of the problem, right? We have the answer. We just want to clean this up a little bit. So any questions so far with the calculus portion? Okay, so here's the cleanup step. Um, I see a couple of things that I can do here. I see um, maybe I can merge some of these together. So I'm going to work on that here. So that same thing as x squared minus 4. I can think of it as distributing a, the 2x through the x minus 1. Continue cleaning that up, and I get negative x squared plus 2x minus 4. OK, so that is my replacement for this piece here. OK, so now we just want to put everything under one fraction. So what belongs in the numerator, we'll put up top. Whatever, whatever belongs in the denominator, we'll put below. So can you guys start suggesting what we can put above and what we can put below? What do you guys see? What can we? How about let's start with the numerator? What goes in the numerator location? Three and then the um, simplified numerator okay. for the derivative. What else? There's one more thing that goes up top. The square. Yeah, x minus one squared, right? Okay. Good. The order doesn't matter, OK? These all multiply together, so if you have these in different order, that's still the same thing. What about the bottom, though? What goes in the denominator? Okay. We see a bunch of x squared minus 4, so the question is how many of the x squared minus 4 is there. It's x squared minus 4 raised to what power? The fourth. Raised to the third. Yeah, so that's the question, right? Is it the third power or is it the fourth power? Okay, looks like the third power. It's the fourth because you, 
put the x squared x minus one squared on top so you have to do that too yeah i think this is easy to miss right we see the x x minus one squared that's pretty obvious but this x squared minus four sometimes we don't we forget that there's an exponent out front and so it's easy to miss so i also want to bring that up a lot of us want to say x squared minus four to the third power because see there's one there there's two there so there's three but there's actually two because this exponent is affecting that as well. So it's, it's actually x squared minus 4 squared and another x squared minus 4, which will make it to the fourth. All right, good. Any questions with this derivative here? Another thing I want to keep pointing out because I keep seeing this a lot is when students do quotient rule, it's just so easy to want to be tempted to cancel these out, but we can't, okay? You never want to cancel your parentheses out with your quotient rule. Yes, just see how you have two of the x squared minus four. Yeah. So can you put uh, x squared minus four squared squared? Like you probably get some Um I guess so. Well, let's see. Yeah, technically it's x squared. You can say it's x squared minus four squared squared. And then if you do it that way, you can think of it as multiplying the exponents. Or you can separate this and add the exponents. So either way, we should be able to get it cleaned up to be like this. So maybe you're thinking this way. You're thinking that it's x squared minus 4 squared squared. You're thinking this way, right? Yeah. Which works. But if we clean this up, if I multiply the exponents together, I'm still down to this as well. Right. Yeah. Good. Any questions with 4? OK, one last one x over square root of x squared minus one. If I see radicals, I'll, I always want to rewrite the problem. So I can rewrite that denominator as what? x squared minus one to the one half power. Good, one half power. Now, compare this with example four. There's also rules involved here that we have to apply. So what rules do you think needs to be involved here for example five? There's also a need for what? Like example four, there's a need for quotient rule. Quotient rule. rule. OK. And what else? Chain. Yeah, do you see that chain rule with the parentheses to the one half? So example four and five, they both require quotient rule and chain rule. But the subtle thing is that the order that we do them in is different. This is actually not in the same order as example four, even though we need the same rules. So I want to kind of spell out something. I want to be able to give you a, a visual hint so that if you see a problem, you know which rule to apply first. All right, so I have some notes I want to get to write down here. So here's the big idea here. Especially problems like four and five. It's like, how do we know which one comes first? OK, so the rule. That affects a larger portion of the problem is applied first. So how do we know which rule affects a larger portion of the problem? 
you look at this, you look at the parentheses. So if the parentheses affects the entire problem, then chain rule comes first. Chain rule is applied first. The other scenario is if the parentheses do not, does not affect the entire problem. If parentheses is only over a portion, then the other rule is applied first. And that other rule could be either quotient or product, but in this case, we're going to stick with quotient. All right, it's a lot more messiness than what we've seen in the past. So look at example four versus five. You see how four has the parentheses over everything? So this indicates that, all right, if parentheses is over everything, then chain rule is going to get applied first. And then once inside chain rule, I can deal with the other rule, in this case, the quotient rule. But this example, you see the larger rule at play is quotient rule. So here, we're going to apply quotient rule first, and then within quotient rule, we can handle this portion, this G prime within quotient rule, with chain rule. So parentheses over everything means chain rule comes first. Parentheses only over a portion of the problem means the other rule comes first. So we can tell by this problem, quotient is the first one. And then chain is the second. So if I want to do quotient first, I'm going to label the parts that's going to be part of my quotient rule. All right, let's see how much of this we can do here. So F prime, what goes in the F prime slot? One. one. Okay, X becomes one. The G function, no changes. We'll just drag that down. F, no changes. Now, G prime is where we have to get, we activate that chain rule portion, right? So chain rule, we know there's going to be an outside and inside portion. So what's the outside? Let's identify those first and then we can build the derivative. So this is kind of like a mini, this is kind of like a mini problem that we have to handle, right? What's the outside portion? Yeah, to the half. Inside portion is x squared minus one. So we're going to apply chain rule and fit it all in here. Okay, it's like a mini problem that we're we're doing chain rule just for this portion. Okay, 
So what's Alsi's derivative? One half the parentheses to the negative one half. Good. Times. What goes here? 2x. And what do we put in this lot? X, X squared, squared minus one. Good. X squared minus one. All over denominator squared. That's our derivative. It's really messy. There's ways that we can um, clean this up, but maybe I'll talk about that later, I think. But at least we got the most important part down, right? This is the answer. It's just we can do a little bit of algebraic cleanup to make this a little prettier, but this is our answer. Questions? So I don't expect you to be able to know how to do this from scratch, but if you can follow along, that's a good start. If you follow along, I'm happy with uh, with the progress we've made. Good. All right, you guys have um, some homework with chain rule uh, in that worksheet. Uh, have a help session tomorrow at 7.45, going over the problems I assigned. But other than that, that's all I have. Thanks guys, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yang. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.